In today's episode, we are reviewing all of our 2021 real estate predictions, where we got it right, where we got it wrong, and really what happened. <laughs> So hi everybody and welcome to the December 25th edition of the Vancouver Life Real Estate Group podcast and YouTube channel. Yes, it is Christmas day, at least that's when we release this. I uh, hope you are enjoying the holiday seasons and you actually got to see some family. Uh, if you are feeling some holiday cheer today, uh, at last check, we were about 10 subscribers away from hitting 500 on our YouTube channel. We would love a subscribe, we'd love a follow. Um, thank you so much. Hey, maybe even a testimonial if you've been enjoying these all year. So let's get into it. As I mentioned off the top, today we are looking back at our 2021 real estate predictions. So on January 2nd of this year, we released a podcast only of our predictions because it was only a year ago that we didn't even have a YouTube channel. <laughs> now we do. Yeah, right. Time certainly flies. So we're going to jump right into it. We're going to talk about all of our predictions and analyze which ones are right, which ones are wrong, and, and then why. And then, of course, even more exciting is next week, January 1st, we're releasing our 2022 real estate predictions. So let's get right into this. Um, off the top, we did make a couple of assumptions to base our predictions on. And, and one of them was that borders were gonna open up in Q2. Uh, I think that really happened in Q3 of this year. And second, we assumed there would be no new variants. <laughs> we are clearly not virus experts <laughs> because I think there's been something like four since the, since, uh, since the beginning of the year here. And of course, we're deep in Omicron right now. So yes, that's that swayed things a bunch, but regardless, that's kind of where we were uh, focusing and, and thinking of and kind of planning for back in January. So number one, here we go. Our first, uh, our first prediction, um, high sales, we're going to continue all year, especially in Q1 and Q2. Uh, we predicted it would not be a record for sales volumes, but would only be about five to 8% below the 2020 um, numbers, which was well above the 10 year average. So eh. gonna, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we missed the mark there. Uh, it was a new record, um, all time high sales for the year. I mean, all time high sales in BC were hit in November and we still had a whole month to go. Um, we're sitting about 8% higher than last year. So Ryan, uh, why? How how did we miss that that prediction? Well, you know it's funny. I think we didn't actually entirely miss it. We got we we got that you know the highest sales volume would happen in Q two. So I you know we were we we're kind of in, in right in there, um, but it doesn't. I, it's usually the case. So anyhow, um, I don't think anybody anticipated. Uh, well, one, the variance to how long this is going on for three, the amount of money that got pumped. Um, and I think that I, I keep, you know, keep going back to a bit of inflation here, but inflation is a big reason why we are 8% higher than probably where we likely anticipated. I don't remember in 2020 us having kind of, I think maybe we talked about it just slightly that inflation would be here, but we didn't really understand like what was going to take place. Right. Um, now we're at 18 year highs for inflation, right? <laughs> Down in the States, it's even worse. So yeah, I, I think that, you know, we, we missed the mark mostly because it was very difficult to anticipate what kind of inflation we were going to see. We didn't know about supply chain issues. We still don't really know if it's transitory uh, and so on and so forth. Right. So I think that was probably a one of the big reasons. Yeah, we're going to see this, I think, over stimulus, if you will, theme kind of continue throughout a lot of these uh, predictions, because realistically, I think they paid out $3 for every $1 of income that was lost. So with people flush with money, you know, this is why we saw so many sales happen. And of course, across the board, right, recreational properties, recreational vehicles, right. um, you know, the, everything hit all time highs, really, you know, you talk to anyone who tried to buy a boat last year, and they're just like, wow, there's, there's nothing available and prices are ridiculous. Yeah, because the, yeah, the sales are. were so high. So yeah. Okay, next one. 
Um, we predicted, as we saw a lot of people move to the suburbs in 2020, that there might be a bit of uh, buyer's remorse there, that people uh, might be getting that call that, hey, you know, great that you moved far away, but the office is open again and you got to start coming back to work. Mm -hmm. um, I think that was only about a half, I think we were half right-ish. Um, because, I mean, you know, again, we're basically about to go into another lockdown here. People are still working from home. Any kind of real return to the city that we are seeing condos lifting, which we'll get into in a bit, there hasn't really been that um, that call back for people, if you will. And of course, the the suburban house prices have really outdone uh, the, the rural ones. So, you know, does it not surprise you that people are happy out there still? Yeah, and I and I think too, um, you know, these variants just keep making it difficult to want to come back and and want to go like God, I would love to go dancing or do something fun, um, but you know we we can't right, and all of that stuff typically is downtown. Um, a lot of the best restaurants or, or a lot of the very very good ones, anyways, are downtown. They're just getting back to figuring out how to dine out, right? So, I still think we're you know, the, the return to downtown, while it's going to happen, um, I, the, the speed at which it's going to happen is, I mean, we did say it was going to take twice as long, um, based on the, the sharp correction that initially happened. Um, we said that it would take twice as long for the correction that took place to come back. So we'll see, uh, we still got another year, but I would be willing to bet that it's going to be more like two, um, just because, you know, we said no variants last year, but I'm going to say that there's going to be variants this year <laughs> and more of them. Right. So, but again, like Dan said, I'm, I'm, I'm no virus expert. <laughs> <laughs> fair, fair. <laughs> All right. Um, we did predict that rents would increase. So if you look largely to the downtown core, for example, they were down about 15 to 18% off their pre pandemic highs. Um, unfortunately, I don't, I couldn't find where we actually made a dollar figure or percentage prediction, but obviously uh, rents, yes, they absolutely have come back. They're basically right at pre pandemic levels right now. So mm -hmm. we, we did know they were going in the right direction. Uh, maybe for, you know, next week's, we'll be sure to do very, you know, hard number predictions for everybody here. Yeah. Now getting more on to maybe where we were right. Um, if you look at the, we, we said there were specific markets to watch last year. Um, the ones that we liked in particular were Squamish, Whistler, Mission, Kelowna, and the Sunshine Coast. And we thought we would see significant gains there. Um, while the GVRD on average saw 15%, Squamish saw 25%, Whistler saw 29%, Mission saw 33%, Kelowna saw 20 and the Sunshine Coast 25 So if you had gone and bought a vacation property when in 2022, you would be up a significant amount, almost in many instances, double had you just invested in the GVRD or bought in the GVRD. Yeah, great work. We were right five for five on that one. Um, we predicted it would be a big year for secondary properties. Whoo, yes. Mm. <laughs> that <laughs> was correct. Was, yeah, this is absolutely correct. So much so that right now uh, in 2021, the number one leading new mortgage uh, by an amount of 25% of all new mortgages was for people buying secondary, third, fourth properties. Largely recreational properties. This is partially why all those um, outlying and sort of recreational areas like your Sunshine Coast and Whistlers did so well. But also people, you know, so rich in equity from this like 35% uh, <laughs> appreciation since the beginning of the pandemic saw they were tapping into that equity via a line of credit and using that to buy other properties. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think we, we, again, we saw the popularity of this um, surge again, because of, of COVID, because of cheap money, because it was easy to get a secondary property, at least while the inventory was there. Now that inventory is gone too. So next year is going to be very interesting. Uh, difficult, I should say. Um, anyhow. So, I mean, um, we did make some Airbnb predictions. Uh, we said that Airbnb was going to have a tremendous year. I think we were thinking it was a derivative of, of everything that was going to be taking place in these um, trishery markets like the Sunshine Coast, where Airbnb would be popular. Now, it 
lo and behold has, but the stock price is what we were predicting at that point. We were thinking the stock was going to go up. It didn't. It's about where it is. <laughs> Um, but again, that's probably because, you know, strong downtown markets and other parts of the world faded hard, right? And that swung the business out. And, and I'm sure that it, it wasn't growth across all markets for them, right? And, you know, that being said, I do have a client who bought in um, the Sunshine Coast this year and, you know, bought so with the intent and purpose of building an Airbnb on the lot, because right now Airbnb's in the Sunshine Coast, average six to seven hundred dollars a night. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I think too. You know, this was largely based on our assumption that borders would open in Q two, which didn't happen, right? We didn't have a summer market here really um, for for cross border travelers, so that really affected it. And of course, too, I think you look at the current landscape, and there's just so much unknown for travel and vacation. So I think Airbnb stock is is kind of you know waiting in the wings because of that. People yeah. are feeling super confident in it. So that's why that stock essentially, yeah, it rose, but then it drops. So it, it's it's flat on the year. And, and that looking back now makes sense. But yeah, I think we missed the mark a bit on that one. Funny, Dan, just lastly with Airbnb, um, Squamish too. We have clients in Squamish with Airbnbs <clears throat> also having record years in Airbnbs in Squamish as well. Squamish market's hot. Squamish Airbnb was really, really hot too. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, agreed. Anyhow. Yeah, so condos. Mm. Specifically, we talked downtown condos. What's going to happen there? We said price-wise, they weren't at the bottom yet, and the prices will rise when the borders open and then race back up at about a 10% average. Um, off with our timing. So condo market downtown actually started rising in December pretty much right when we did this pod a year ago. Um, so it came back earlier than expected. It came back prior to the borders reopening and it ended up rising 8%. So it and happened earlier and then not not as much. So interesting, you know, at the end of the year, it kind of settled where we thought it would-ish. Um, but it, again, the resilience came much earlier. Yeah, and, and I, think, I think we saw it happen earlier because one inventory and two affordability, especially affordability now, right? We're seeing, you know, people go out, try to buy big, big houses. They did, they bought up all the existing inventory, whatever was left rose up in price, priced out, come back to condos, right? And I, I think that's why now, especially now we're seeing the pump in condos. Um, and I think that's gonna be around for the next little bit. There seems to be this reoccurring theme of 15%. Mm -hmm. If an area drops about 15%, buyers come in. Mm -hmm. And we've seen it in three, four different markets, three, four different times. And it's something we've really sort of identified as a trigger uh, percentage amount that kind of people look at it and be like, okay, Vancouver real estate is on sale at 15% off of its previous high. Yeah. That's the time to buy. Yeah, I, I, think, I think you're right. I mean, we've got historical data that shows that, um, you know, and... and um, there was that, that steep correction thanks to COVID. Well, not steep, but quick correction, right? And then the way it went. And, and again, that was just, I think, again, largely based on affordability. And I think that's going to be true now that's going to push condo prices more than anything is going to be affordability um, and availability. Absolutely. We looked to the suburbs, especially Abbotsford, and said, yes, we expect condos to rise a little bit stronger out there. Um, again, I don't think we put an exact dollar or percentage on it, but hey, that one was definitely correct where Abbotsford condos are up a whopping 28% since Woo. January. Woo. Wow, that is a huge number. <laughs> uh, we also said that suburbs um, would have sustained growth. Um, and when we were absolutely correct. Um, with that being said, Dan, let's talk about duplexes and townhomes because... That was an insane asset class this year, like insane. <laughs> it, yeah, it pretty much took the cake, if you will. Um, Ryan predicted it would be very strong performance in that asset class for at least the next three to five years. Um, and while we are focusing on this year, it was definitely true in, tw in 2021. Um, so much so that we kind of isolated East Van as being the, um, the most desirable townhome duplex market. and. I think I made a comment that if I was a developer, that's what I, where I would yeah. be focusing. Yeah, you did say that, yeah. I, if I was a developer now, I would be building duplexes in East Van. 
Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. And, and, and I, you know what, generally speaking, when you look at the fact that townhomes and duplexes in the GVRD went up by about 26% last year, right? That's on average. That, that kind of rise, I mean, I, I said, you know, three to five years would be great for if it did 26% in three to five years, it would still be great. <laughs> it did 26% in one of those three to five years, <laughs> right? So yeah, I, I think, you know, and, and going forward again, because of availability and because of affordability, this asset class is going to continue to be the most popular. Um, you're going to see people living in those neighborhoods um, where they want to be in a single family home, but that price point is now stratospheric for most people. So what's the next best option? Splitting that lot, subdividing it, putting a, um, or putting a duplex on it, something to that effect where you can increase the density, but still get that neighborhood feel, right? And that's why we're seeing East Van becoming so popular with a lot of its old stock returning new um, in the form of duplex and triplex. Yeah, while we saw this kind of across the board, especially of course in detached, but every time that we offered on a duplex or townhouse in East Van, it was in heavy, often double digit multiples. Yeah, yeah, huge. I mean, both Dan and I ended up buying a duplex this year, moving our families into them, right? So we believe in the product as well. Um, and, and that and that neighborhood yeah. yeah yeah but um you know generally speaking um i think it's a fabulous asset class to own uh going into the future okay let's talk detached uh because uh, we thought it was going to be the major driver in the marketplace and you know lo and behold i think it was easily the most sought after property oh. type in all of 2021 yeah absolutely um Sales to active numbers were gnarly for detached homes for most of this year. Um, and, and I think, you know, COVID was probably the main driver, people wanting more space, people wanting to be less dense and not around as many people. And in doing so, allowing, you know, the, the digital tech revolution that's taking place to also come into the home. Right. So now people look to work from home. We get deliveries, Amazon groceries, all that kind of stuff now comes direct to the house. Right. So um, the value and the utility of the home grew tremendously. Um, and I think that's also a, a new value add and why people are spending more on these homes, because they have more utility than than they would have um, even just a few years ago. Right. The demand is still obscene. Uh, a colleague of mine offered on a, a detached in Abbotsford yesterday. Um, unfortunately, I don't have the details to share other than the fact that it received over 20 offers and sold for 471,000 over ask. In, on December 20th. Yeah. A five days before Christmas, that kind of activity in the market. Yeah. So it, uh, clearly it was well, well, well under listed, but deceiving take it for what it is. But uh, again, people are throwing huge numbers around. He was 400 K over ask and lost. Wow. Oh, I mean, you know, and, and the Valley's crazy. I mean, just to go back quickly to, to townhomes here, um, I was doing a report for a, a, a client looking at um, townhomes in Maple Ridge in the month of November. So just last month, and the sales to active ratio Dan, was 179%, which is so bananas. Like we talk about a, a really hot seller's market being, you know, somewhere between 30 and 50%. This was at 179%. I don't even know how that makes sense, but it's off the chart. Yeah. I think they're including sales in the metaverse in that one now. <laughs> yeah. As digital real estate sales. <laughs> Anyhow. Okay, so yeah, detached, uh, safe to say we were correct in thinking that would be the major driver and uh, it largely still is. Yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, let's move along here. So Bank of Canada, obviously very early on came out and said that they're gonna keep rates pinned to the bottom for two to three years. Um, we basically agreed with that. We didn't think they would have the chance to change any earlier. Um, you know, maybe it won't be three years. We'll get into that in the next pod, but they certainly were true to that statement for all of 2021. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They were, they, they, they came out with the rhetoric to, you know, get people to spend the money they were going to print. Right. That's what they, that was the the message. And a lot of that happened. A lot of it got saved too. 
Mm -hmm. And, you know, based on that comment, we predicted that investors would come in hard to the market, right? You can't tell people that you're going to keep rates cheap forever, I'm sorry, forever, for, for three, four years, two, three years, and not have investors pay attention. And of course they did. And as we just touched on, they are the leading new mortgage applicants today. So investors were absolutely in there. Yeah, you've got you've got an interest rate of call it one and a half percent, two percent, and you've got market growth on average at twenty plus twenty five percent. Simple, simple, simple math. That's simple it. math, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, there was a lot of talk of potential of rates going negative. And we said, no, they will not be doing that. They will be staying status quo. That one was uh, bang on. They did mm -hmm. stay at uh, what they call their lower bound of a quarter point, but they did not go to zero or negative. So we were right on that one. Just rode the line. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. And, and um, you know, I, I think I came out and I said that the Bank of Canada would have to pay very close attention to inflation. <laughs> yes, I, that was definitely bang on. Um, what they are doing about it, I didn't say anything to. Um, and maybe I'll, I'll, I'll keep that for, for next week. But generally speaking, um, I don't think we would have envisioned uh, maybe inflation quite getting this high and running maybe this hot. Um, but you know, we'll see. We'll see how that carries on. I mean, <clears throat> I say that now, and Omicron's here, and things are shutting down left, right, and center. You know, people are are getting more and more COVID tests. You know, cases are going up like crazy. So it's very possible here. Uh, more inflation's coming. I don't know. It's kind of scary. <laughs> so here's what I'm quite proud of. Uh, while we agreed Bank of Canada would not raise interest rates, uh, I predicted that the banks would start raising their rates by Q4. Nice. And that is exactly what happened. Yeah. Um, you know, we're up, gosh, a full basis point on your uh, fixed rates right now. And the reason that was predicted is because we know that the banks, while they look to the overnight rate by the Bank of Canada, they can independently move, you know, at will. Mm -hmm. And so kind of looked at the future of what was happening. I'm like, look, banks want to make more money too. There's so much new credit being pumped out there. Good chance that they're going to have the opportunity to increase because they can. And because while well, didn't predict it for this reason, you know, once inflation starts going up, they're allowed to kind of inch up as well and, and kind of help their bottom line. Agreed. Yeah. And that's, that's a really good prediction. I think, you know, you probably saw what they saw. <laughs> In many ways, it's, it's right? an opportunity. Why would yeah. we capitalize? Yeah, exactly. Um, we said that local demand would keep us afloat, but that international demand would drive growth. And while that was true, we vastly underestimated the local demand mm -hmm. uh, because it grew regardless. The border stayed closed for a lot longer than we had anticipated, <clears throat> and the market still went bananas um, and is still going bananas. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know, and we we haven't really had an open border. It's it's you can still go. You still you know have to either provide tests. There's still you know, it's difficult to travel still, right? It's not it's not like it was before. So you know, I don't think that the international side was really a huge player in this. I think it may be a, a big player though was the fact that we converted a ton of. Um, people who had already immigrated to Canada into uh, permanent residence this year. I think that was a, that could be a fairly significant thing because those people can now buy homes without paying the foreign buyers tax, right? That's good. <clears throat> okay. So we also expected that there would be new housing taxation by the middle of 2021. What happened? Hey, snap election. <laughs> and what was promised within that election? New real estate taxes. So while they're not kicking in until next year, they were created, you know, sort of Q3 2021. So maybe we call that a push. <laughs> <laughs> and, and to be fair, um, there was a lot of things promised in this election that I don't think are going to come true. <laughs> but tax will be one of them that does. 
That's it. Well, it's the easiest one. It's That's the right. easiest one. And again, right, even even okay, well, here's one. Uh property taxes increased more than average, right? They're at six, four percent or something like that, compared to the five percent. And something that we touched on is like, look, if you're gonna increase the value of my house by fifteen percent, but only raise my taxes one and a half percent higher than normal, you know, most people are going to be okay with it if they look at it through that lens. Yeah, especially knowing that we've got a, you know, there's a massive amount of money that's come out of our economy here and to keep everything afloat, right? If we don't start paying it back, then inflation will just keep going, we'll keep printing money and it'll just, the problem just gets worse, right? So there, you, you, we have to pay a, uh, we have to pay the piper here at some point. <laughs> that is it. Okay. Uh, the deferral cliff. Do you Ooh, remember that? The nasty deferral cliff. That was going to yeah. end everything. <laughs> yeah. The the, um, the naysayers were pointing that to be the end all. The, the, the whole market was going to crash because of the deferral cliff, which was when people, after their six-month deferral time frame, had to start making their mortgage payments again. Well, that happened in October of 2020. Now, mm. worst case scenario, it takes about 12 months for banks to foreclose on a property that someone has not been paying their mortgage on. It, it's not a quick thing. So here we are 14 months later and we predicted no foreclosures, no cliff of any kind. We were 100% correct. Mm. Everybody keep paying their mortgage. Actually, mortgage payments, uh, delinquencies are at a record low. Yeah, I mean, when when you think about it, I, I, I mean, a lot of this noise, I think, came from, um, oh, uh, why can't I, is it escaping me? major lender who got it all wrong. Oh, CMHC? CMHC, yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of this deferral cliff noise came from that side of the, the world and, and boy, were they wrong. Um, but on top of that, you know, historically Canadians pay their mortgages. We know this, it's, it's, it's cultural. 76% of Canadians own their home. The vast majority of their dollars are going into their houses and we'll go there first. Right. So well, all the data, right. Everybody was flushed with cash. Savings was at double totally. digit rates. Like totally. everything pointed to this being a nothing burger. You yeah. cannot look to one data point and think that's, that's right. going to affect the market greatly, especially when there are five contradictory uh, yeah. data points. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. Mortgage payments are going to kick in again. Okay. But brrr, all these people are rich. Uh, houses are up. They've got equity. You know, it just everything pointed to that being totally a non-issue. Yeah. And when you get that kind of equity growth in your home, you know, there are ways to use that equity to stave off any kind of, you know, foreclosure or something to that effect. Anyways, none of, none of it really added up. Like Dan said, a great big nothing burger. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Let's uh, move on now to permanent residents. Uh, they came out early 2021 and say, hey, we're going to put 401,000 PRs into Canada this year. And we said, good luck with that. We thought they were going to miss it. Um, <laughs> We were wrong. Oops. 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 Don't, yeah. yeah. Don't they are the man. <laughs> <laughs> well, and this this is very interesting to me because yes, while most uh, people who got their PR in 2021 already lived here, right? It wasn't really a border issue. It goes to show that when people, sorry, when the government really wants to truly make something happen, and why? Obviously, because PRs are now paying a different tax than they were before. They're buying homes with that PTT, et cetera. Mm -hmm. They're going to find a way to do it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've <laughs> talked about the government throwing people and bodies at uh, easing the building permit issues. Well, it's not really solved it. But hey, if they want to put 401 PRs into the country, they find a way. Like, honestly, I think if they truly wanted to make things like building permit easier, they would find the man manpower to make oh, that happen. Man, I mean, we're talking about, you know, again, we, we never ever, we always tax supply, right? Or sorry, tax demand. So it, it's kind of a strange position. It's like, we've got local demand, but let's keep pushing this. So we're going to keep stuffing more and more people into the demand side of things, but we're not going to change the supply side of things, right? That just drives the price, mm -hmm. right? And a lot of what happened this year too, a lot of those uh, permanent residents that became permanent residents uh, this year were already here, right? So it's not like they came across the border this year. Um, vast majority were, well, I mean, some did, but the vast majority were already here waiting for their PRs to take place. And lo and behold, they happened at an astounding rate this year, whereas years before it could take a lot longer. So like Dan said, if they're looking for a reason to, to make things happen, they certainly can. 
And I think just like Dan said, it's got a lot to do with them getting into the real estate market uh, because a lot of that workforce is very skilled as well. It's a highly skilled workforce, um, technically skilled. And, um, you know, they're working from home, usually in the tech sector and the healthcare, th- you know, side of things. And, and um, that's where we're seeing the push. Yeah, exactly. Um, okay, let's talk pre-sales. Um, pre-sale market, we predicted it to spike. Uh, again, I apologize, we didn't put a hard number on it, um, but we did expect a spike. And that was largely based quite simply on the fact that resale is spiking, right? Those two are absolutely tethered to each other. If resale tanks, pre-sales tank. So it was a bit of an inevitability. Um, and lo and behold, yes, we were absolutely correct. Um, but to the tune of check this out, just last month, for example, November saw a 69% absorption rate in the pre-sale market. Oof. Think of that as the sales to active listings ratio, yeah. 69%, massive. Um, November, 2020 was 18%, for example. Wow. Huge wow. difference, wow. right? Whereas, um, yeah, I mean, it's uh, three, three, um, three and a half times the difference. Yeah, right? exactly. And October was like 40% of this year. So again, overall pre-sale market, absolutely having a, a, a ripping year as well. Um, it's just, again, it's, it's an inevitability, uh, also based on incredibly low inventory, right? Yeah. Today, we are sitting on all time record low inventory in GVRD. People naturally are going to look to pre-sale markets as a potential solution and with all these investors in the market, they're looking to pre-sales a lot too. So, mm-hmm. yeah, I tend to agree. Um, okay, well, we also talked about the luxury market. We said that the luxury market would actually accelerate and and do quite quite well. I think we said you know places like West Van, uh, Point Grey, um, and they did do quite well. Uh, one one place that that really soared was actually North Vancouver luxury market. Um, we saw that really actually catch up in a big, big way to, uh, the West Van side of things. I mean, not, not, you know, in the high, super, super high end, but you know, your four to $6 million range. Wow. Did we see North Vancouver kind of explode this year in that respect? Um, so we said, uh, or sorry, there was a 146 homes this year that sold over 7 million and a whopping 102 that sold over 8 million. Um, and for reference, in 2020, we had 71 luxury homes that sold and 45 over 8 million. Yeah, we're talking double the amount that sold in 2020. So the luxury market just absolutely exploded in 2021. Just yeah. an immense amount of confidence in the high end market this year. Yeah. Yeah, completely agree. Um, rental predictions, we said uh, 50% uh, comeback in rental rates of the amounts that were lost. Uh, we were wrong. <laughs> uh, a lot of it came back like 90, 95%. You know, I, I still think that that's climbing and will continue to. Um, yeah, we, we missed that one pretty significantly. And it was largely due to Again, the PR and how many, also how many um, kids have been admitted to school in fall. Because mm-hmm. you look out to like the UBC area, for example, and it is just a brutal, brutal rental market if you were trying to get into it. Um, and of course, a lot of people did come back to the city. Uh, we saw those downtown rents, like we said, come back to basically pre pandemic levels. So we definitely underestimated the resilience in the rental market this year. Yeah, um, it'll be interesting to see how it plays out too. Um, because I think as inventory continues to dwindle, typically rents will continue to climb, right? So um, anyhow, unemployment, we said would get better. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Kind of an easier prediction um, when everything was terrible at the time. That being said, um, you know, I think we said unemployment rate would be somewhere in the six and a half to seven percent range. Close, we're at six percent now. Um, you know, Canada is one percent above the pre-pandemic level, so you know that's that's decent news. And and BC is is even better, right? So, yeah. um, like like to see that. Um, 
like to see it get better but we'll see for sure yeah it'll improve yeah. oh yeah that'll be a fun one to talk about uh for 2022 oh, yeah. here uh we also predicted wages to increase uh, we thought they would go up on average by six percent so we were pretty optimistic there uh while they did go up and they did go up above average it only hit 3.9 percent as of uh, last month so december hasn't been reported but for the year it's going to be floating someone in somewhere in and around four percent and and for all you people out there who do care about inflation if your inflation is at 4.7 percent and your wage increase is at 3.9 percent your mate the, the, the value of your cash is going down yeah, you're making less than you need to to stay status quo. Correct. Yeah. Okay, here's the fun one. Pricing. Oh, boy. Okay, we made some big predictions on where <laughs> pricing would go. And, um, well, let's just get right into it here. So, for reference, in 2020, the condominium market increased in value by about 2.5%. Uh, we predicted that 2021 would be pretty similar at around 3%. <laughs> Uh, but thought downtown would be a standout at 10%. Um, Ryan, what were the actuals? Yeah, a little off on that. Uh, pricing went up by 11%. Um, you know, and our downtown, our downtown prediction was 8%. So we weren't that far off on the downtown side of things. We do know that market really, really well, right? So to be fair, um, but man, were we, um, you know, we were almost four times off the mark. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Um, okay. Well, <laughs> let's try our luck at our, our townhome prediction. Where? In 2020, 5% increase. And we looked at the landscape at the time. And, you know, even though we did discuss that duplexes and, and uh, townhomes were going to do great, especially in East Van, we still thought, you know, a nice 5% on the year would be uh, a reasonable target. Brian? Yeah, we, we again... We were off by about 4x on that as well. Went up by about 20%. <laughs> uh, I, and I'm laughing because of, I, I, I think it, it one, the, the, the rise was so sharp and so fast, but two also, I just don't know how we really could have predicted this knowing the outcome of the pandemic. It's just been, it's just been such a wild ride. Yeah, I mean, let's be honest here. We are in an environment right now where Canadian homes overall rose 25 percent in the last 12 months right that number's never been seen before we are in a once in a lifetime market no one predicted this and if you if you remember back to those cmhc days when they were you know talking negative 18 uh, percent or something like that and it went up 20 you know sure they were wrong 38 percent but that just gives and these are you know a corporation that's been around for a very long time and you'd yeah. think their analysts would be a little bit more accurate regardless um, not trying to negate how off we were with these price uh, <laughs> estimates, but again, it, it's 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 a challenge to predict prices in a an environment that's never been seen before. Yeah, and also, uh, you know, if you speak to any sort of economist or anyone who's who who really studies the subject, you'll know that there's so there's just so many moving pieces in the economy, and it, it it's almost impossible to predict the outcome of every moving piece, and that's why. We see, um, you know, we got close in some areas because we kind of understand maybe the, the behavior better of the people there or, or the product a little bit better, the demand. But generally speaking, this pandemic just blew cycles out of the water. It blew predictions kind of out of the water. Um, and everybody just, you know, held on. <laughs> Right. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk detach, Dan, because in 2020, detach saw a whopping 10% gain, which is no joke. But uh, what did we say? We predicted what? We predicted the same. Interesting that we really thought 2020 would emulate 2021. We did. So we thought detach would hit around a 10%, which, you know, historically is still well above average. Mm -hmm. But yeah, in actuality, <laughs> uh, detach was your second highest performer at 18% wow. overall GPRD. Yeah. So, um, a bit better though, in terms of predictions and <laughs> not four X off, but two X. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I guess, yeah, lastly, so we also look at GVRD as a whole, wherein we predicted an 8% rise overall, again, above the 10 year average. So we were expecting it to outperform normal, but we didn't expect the actual yeah, the actual being 15%, right? 
Now, again, some of this, Dan, we didn't realize how much money might have been printed, right? We, we didn't know that inflation rates were going to get to where they got. There's a lot of reasons why we got to 15% that you know, weren't necessarily taking place in the market by the time we made the predictions. Yeah, it was it was a fun year to make predictions on, of course. <laughs> um, you know, you, you can't see 12 months into the future. You can't. It's hard to see 12 days sometimes. But um, hey, we are here to, you know, share our thoughts and, and share our 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 analysis of the data. And, and I think, you know, overall, maybe score ourselves a, a B minus on this one. You know, I, I, think... I would even say a B. OK, I mean, you sure. know, hey, it's good, good returns if, if we're making, you know, yeah, half I of, think eight percent on your real estate in a year. That's pretty good. I think overall our trajectories were all spot on. Uh, and, and realistically, we just underestimated the resilience and power of this market. And of course, of those printing machines. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, the government in intervention, the stimulus side of things. I mean, um, yeah, it, it's been, what, 100 years since we had a pandemic. So, you know, I don't think anybody went and looked back at what happened at real estate prices then and nor would they even have the same market forces. So <laughs> That's right. Okay. Well, hey, thank you as always so much for watching and listening. Again, if you're feeling that holiday cheer, please subscribe. We'd love to have you be that number 500 or 501. And um, next week, hey, next week is our 2022 predictions. I think we learned a lot uh, by going through this, this process here. And uh, we're really excited to share our thoughts and analysis on what you should expect for 2022. Um, as always, if you're thinking about buying or selling, there is lots of ways to navigate this properly. Work with a professional. Give us a call. We're here to help.